You didn't build a great business by being timid. And now it's time to get back to business the same way you built it, with passion. UBS is here with the resources and knowledge you need today. We've weathered the storm with business owners for more than 150 years. And what we've learned can help you right now, not just for your own personal goals, for your business. With insights and strategies to help you get up and running with the focus and determination that made you a success in the first place. It's a matter of asking the right questions and speaking with the right people who can help you find the solutions to move your business forward. With UBS, the possibilities are endless, but the focus is always on you, your family, and your business. Why not benefit from all of the knowledge and resources available to you from UBS? Few people could have built what you built. Proceed with passion. Welcome everyone from wherever you may be logging on. This is the Leadership Lunch Series sponsored by UBS. I'm Shirley Leung and uh, I'm a columnist at the Boston Globe. Uh, today, we'll be having a conversation with Marcelo Suarez Oresco, who officially became the Chancellor of the University of uh, Massachusetts Boston on August 1st. Marcelo is the first Latino to lead a campus in the state's public university uh, system. While Marcelo uh, most recently was a dean at UCLA, he is no stranger to Boston, having been a professor of education at Harvard uh, and co-director of the Harvard Immigration Project. Um, but before we begin our conversation, we're gonna hear from Ian McNeil, the UBS branch office manager in downtown Boston. Thank you, Shirley. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for joining us, at least virtually today. Uh, my name is Ian McNeil, I'm the branch manager, as she just mentioned, in our downtown Boston office. Um, so I actively work with our financial advisors to provide world-class financial advice and services for our clients and their families' well-being. Uh, you know, we're really eager to be a part of this conversation today on the future of public higher education. One that is being reshaped by the pandemic for sure, and one that is near and dear to Boston as we find ourselves surrounded by 45 universities and colleges in the local area. And for myself, uh, I've got two kids of my own, uh, not that far off from attending a university or college, hopefully locally, uh, so I'm quite interested too, uh, eager to hear what's happening. So I'd like to thank today's guest speaker, University of Massachusetts in Boston, Chancellor Marcello Suarez, Carrasco, and of course, thank you to Shirley Young and The Globe for their continued work and dedication in bringing together our local leaders to discuss topics that are relevant to the greater Boston community. Um, so with so many colleges and universities in the greater Boston area, these institutions are such an important part of the city's ecosystem. The implications of the pandemic on these schools, as well as the students and their families within our community is of the utmost importance during this uncertain time. We look forward to hearing from Marcello, um, the thoughts and insights on this incredibly timely topic. So please join us in welcoming his remarks. Shirley and Marcello, thanks. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Ian, and thank you, UBS, for your sponsorship of this series. Uh, we're just waiting for Marcelo. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> Hi, Chancellor. <laughs> I think you're still on mute. <laughs> oh, Charlie, it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you on Zoom again. Um, and thank you, uh, thank you for participating in this program today. Uh, as you know, I prepared some questions for you, but we also have pre-submitted questions from the audience. Um, if anyone wants to ask a question during the panel, please use your Q&A function. Uh, the chat function has been turned off. Uh, so Chancellor, welcome back to Boston. Um, are you settled in? Did, did you find a place to live? <laughs> Uh, I'm settled in, uh, we packed, we moved across the country, 
we quarantine and now we're renting an apartment in Boston. We were hoping to buy, but because of the pandemic and because of uh, the um, challenges that the pandemic put before us, we uh, are currently renting. Our idea was to be near the, the T so we could uh, take public transportation uh, to work. Uh, we'll see how that unfolds. But here's a piece of advice from uh, the Chancellor of UMass Boston. Do not plan to move across the country during a pandemic. Not a good idea. <laughs> well, I'm glad you decided to take the plunge. <laughs> um, and you're, you're uh, joining us from your office, right, at, at UMass Boston? Yes, I am in the, the beautiful uh, peninsula. I'm in my office. I try to come uh, as often as possible. And uh, I'm uh, so, so delighted to be back in, in the Commonwealth uh, and to be at the helm of this uh, extraordinary public research university mm -hmm. in the city of Boston. Yeah. So UMass Boston made a decision back in June to go remote only. I, I think, it, you know, it was very early on in the pandemic. And um, so, uh, or, you know, making a decision about the fall, you know, uh, very fast. So why was that the right decision for the campus to go remote only? Um, I think for, for a number of reasons. So first of all, I was not uh, <clears throat> the chancellor then, but I was in, in, uh, in constant uh, communication with the then interim uh, chancellor and the senior leadership. Uh, interestingly, both UCLA, I was a dean of UCLA's oldest uh, school, both UCLA and UMass Boston early on uh, it, it made a decision. Uh, and we are now at uh, uh, almost identical places, meaning we decided early on to go remote uh, over 90 plus percent of all our teaching and learning now is, uh, is uh, remote, uh, very much like the decision that UCLA made. And it was the right decision for a variety of reasons. First, this is a wicked, wicked uh, pandemic that we're facing. Uh, second, we are a commuter campus. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, we need to be mindful of the fact that our students come in and out of campus. Third, we serve uh, a population that comes from uh, extraordinary diversity, including um, first generation to college students, um, students that are immigrant origin students, returning students, and the, 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 the populations we serve tend to be the populations that are also at the forefront of taking on the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So given our demographics, uh, given our location, given what we are learning about um, the pandemic, given the new tools for remote teaching and learning, I believe that UMass Boston, prior to my arrival, made the right decision. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a wise decision, it was a prudent decision, and I am happy to report that the, uh, the teaching and learning, the arrival of our students, a, a small number of students have come back to our um, residence halls, has all been done in, a, uh, in an extremely careful, uh, with a great deal of um, smarts and a great deal of heart. We were very, very careful onboarding our students into our, our residence halls, following the science, following the public health recommendations and following common sense as to how to take on this enormously destructive pandemic. So who's on campus now? Paint us a picture of, of how big the student population is. It's the only majority minority campus in the, the, the state university system. Um, you know, who, who, who's, who's walking around campus today? So today we have uh, a, a small number of students, mm -hmm. students that uh, need 
to be face to face because of the requirements to keep them on time to achieve their dream of completing their college degree. Mostly laboratory work, we are very mindful of the proxemics, the social distancing, the, hy the hy hygiene. We are staggering the arrival. So at, at any given time, only a small number of students will find themselves in the laboratories. All our students are tested. We have a testing regime now, uh, weekly. Uh, also, in our campus uh, residential halls, we have capacity for approximately slightly over a thousand students. We made a judgment that we would bring back a small, a small ish number of students. So today, approximately 300 students are living in our uh, residential halls. And the criteria we use for that uh, determination and judgment was offering every one of our students single occupancy rooms with private uh, bathrooms. We believe that's the, the gold standard. We believe that that enables us to be able to uh, offer the required social distancing. We also have room to um, quarantine and to isolate should that be necessary. Mm -hmm. Likewise, we're testing the students on a weekly basis. So we put in place uh, the bulk of the entirety, really, of the recommendations that flow from the science, what we're learning about the pandemic, from the judgments and the recommendations of our uh, public uh, health uh, authorities, as well as we, are, what we ourselves are learning from our experience and also what we're learning from our peer institutions, both mm -hmm. in the Commonwealth and across the country. Mm -hmm. Now, you were selected as chancellor in February before the pandemic gripped the world, right? So has COVID-19 changed your vision for what you want to accomplish at UMass Boston? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, yes, in that obviously um, we have now a new set of very clear and very urgent uh, priorities. Numero uno, we need to protect the territory that UMass Boston has gained over the last few years in terms of um, budget matters and in terms of enrollment and in terms of continuing to offer a student, our students uh, the best education so that they can pursue uh, their, their academic, their scholarly uh, interests and the dream of, of completing their, their college education. But of course, new priorities uh, have, uh, have come uh, to the fore. First, uh, safety. And by safety, I mean both the medical side of the equation as well as wellness uh, and health in the psychological, in the cultural, uh, in, in the domains that are so central. The data surely uh, are speaking very loudly here. Uh, the mood disorders, anxiety and depression are going up. Uh, suicidality, um, all kinds of, uh, of uh, concerns over health and well-being have to be my number one priority today. The health and the wellness of our students, of our faculty, of our staff is my greatest priority uh, today. We need to make sure that our faculty and staff have all the tools they need to be able to connect, to be able to manage this uh, remote 2.0, let's call it that, so that our students remain engaged, remain bonded, and they can continue to make progress in their, teach, in their learning so that they can uh, stay on time towards, uh, towards their, uh, their degree. These, these three issues, safety, how do we maintain and keep the territory we were able to gain 
through blood, sweat, and tears in, 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 in prior years? And how do we ensure that uh, we can do, um, that we can battle another pandemic? And that pandemic is COVID, uh, Zoom, remote fatigue. Mm -hmm. How do we, how do we um, remain bonded? And we're doing a lot of innovative things to be able to engage and to be able to offer our students a, an experience where their learning and their flourishing is at the heart of, the, uh, of, of, the, of their experience this very difficult year for all of us. Can you give us an example of an innovative, uh, I guess, strategy to uh, learning <laughs> for learning? Yeah. Uh, 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 of, of course, uh, Shirley, we have an initiative uh, addressing what I think is uh, our other pandemic in our country, uh, which is uh, inequality and uh, particularly a, a, a deeply, deeply concerning dynamic. The racialization of inequality has now um, become uh, a, a real threat to the practice of democratic citizenship in our, in our commonwealth, in our country, uh, but more broadly in the world at large. So we have taken, for example, in our Beacon 2020 initiative, we have taken a marvelous, a marvelous um, uh, book called Homegoing, uh, and we're devoting a great deal of time. This is a, 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 it's a novel, it's a brilliant study, um, examining, you know, 400 years of the experience of our African-American brothers and sisters uh, in the uh, context of uh, uh, race, uh, racialized inequalities, racial violence. And we're using this reading as a point of entry to really examine both historically in the here and now, as well as beginning to develop the instruments, the vehicles to make our university a public research university in the city of Boston, a leader in anti-racist education. This is a topic that defines our commonwealth, that defines our country. And surely the eyes of the world are upon the commonwealth because we equal education. And as the world is undergoing a historic demographic transition, the only sector of the child population that is growing are children of color. As we prepare to connect with, ease the transition into the family of the nation, into the labor market, into citizenship of this, the most diverse cohort of young people, in the history of our commonwealth, how do we develop the tools so that every voice is heard? Every child has the opportunity to learn to the great potential that all human beings carry within ourselves. So we are taking a pandemic, we're using a pandemic to address the issues pertinent to the other pandemic that very much is at the center of our nation today and our future moving forward. Mm -hmm. So I have one last question for me about related to UMass Boston and then I'll transition to audience questions. So um, until your arrival, uh, until you started, UMass Boston did not have a permanent leader for three years and it went through a lot of financial turmoil and tumult. How do you heal those wounds? Thank you, Shirley. Um, first, listening, listening, Charismatically, uh, I believe that empathy is one of the great tools of every society, every culture. Uh, and I believe that uh, learning and trying to address um, the, the, the hurt and the chagrins, uh, grievances of the past 
is a fundamental step. I also believe, you know, it was the great um, uh, Soren Kierkegaard who said, we only understand our, our lives looking, looking back, mm -hmm. looking backwards. But the other part that folk don't remember of, of Kierkegaard's famous dictum is, but we only live looking forward. It's in our stereoscopic vision. It's in our neocortex. It's how we evolved as a species looking forward. So I'm listening. I am a, 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 with an empathic ear. I'm endeavoring to understand the variables, but I am also, I am also um, like, um, like all immigrants, uh, I look to the future uh, more than to the past. I look to the future and the future to me in the peninsula, in this great city of education uh, is a very promising uh, future. A city in the 21st century cannot, cannot uh, thrive without a vibrant public research university. I say Boston has uh, a wonderful place in our country when it comes to education, unique. Uh, let me try a Cartesian binary exercise here. Our students come to Boston really two, in two ways. Most students fly into Logan with round trip tickets. They come, they're gonna study in our great universities. They're gonna go back to their homes. Our students at UMass Boston come through the K-Circle. They come and they are the citizens. They are the children of the Commonwealth. They are our future scientists. They are our future um, uh, first responders. They are the future citizens, the future labor force of the great Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So to me, even in the context of the extraordinary ecology, the genome that is Boston in terms of education is unique. There are probably, there isn't any, another city in the world that has this unique feature. We are Boston's public university and there can't be a happy future for our city without us offering our students the opportunities to learn with excellence, with ethics, with engagement, with empathy, with equity in mind. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you for that uh, very impassioned uh, explanation. Um, so we have, as we have so many great uh, pre-submitted questions. We have a really savvy audience uh, here today, um, and many of their questions centered around how COVID might reshape higher education. So one of the first questions is, how will colleges work to address the learning loss and learning gap that is emerging with COVID-19 and the huge disparities it is causing, especially within low-income communities? Very, very important, very significant. And I would say that this is one of the defining challenges. How do we make sure that all our students have the tools they need to be at the table? Now, even if the table is a Zoom room, uh, and is, uh, and is uh, online. Uh, and there are two sides to that equation. Do they have the tools themselves to this, our students to engage, uh, to be prepared, to be, to be ready? Um, do, do, do we have access to the technologies that are required uh, for uh, engaging? The second, the, the other side of that algorithm is, is the faculty and our, our staff, uh, do they have the tools they need to continue to engage and to continue to deliver uh, teaching and learning. I believe that we're learning enormously. I, this is the greatest ex experiment 
in the history of what we now call the research university. The research university, as we current, as we now understand it, began about a thousand years ago uh, in Bologna, and not since that moment, not since really the Prussians invented chalk and talk education, have we had to do uh, what we've done um, quite well, given the circumstances, on a dime, changing all teaching and learning to a remote mode. I believe that we are learning. I believe that we are all being socialized to the opportunities and to the advantages that uh, remote teaching and learning uh, can offer. We need to address the matter of are our students maintaining the progress at our university in terms of following their coursework. I am, uh, of course, mindful that we are, uh, as a species, we are a social species. We're homo sapiens sociabilis. We're social. A hundred years of basic research in, in what we now call cognitive neuroscience has one lesson, and that is all learning is relational. All learning is um, in the context of a relationship between a more advanced mentor learner and a more novice learner that we're moving up. The question is, how do we ensure that that fundamental, that's at the heart of the DNA of all teaching and learning, how do we uh, ensure, how do we engineer ways to uh, relationally connect the faculty, the students, the staff, so that we can uh, germinate that fantastic, uniquely human capacity to learn relationally. It is a challenge, but we are making good progress. And I believe that when the pandemic is over, when we go back to face-to-face -face teaching and learning, we will have learned a great deal about the new avenues, avenues that can be put uh, to work in the service of equity, in the service of access, in the service of reaching uh, all our communities with new, with new vehicles, making education a more available reality for our communities. Mm -hmm. I just want to remind the live audience that if you have a question, you can use the Q&A function to submit a new question. Um, here's another question, a follow-up to that question um, that was pre-submitted. Uh, how will college acceptances and financial aid for low-income and first-generation first generation students be affected by the pandemic crisis? I, I think the, the question gets at, uh, will some of the gaps in learning be, I guess, taken into an account when you when you look at um, when uh, you know during the college admissions process? Because we know that there will be huge disparities and in inequities in learning going on at the high school level. I think that that's a very very important question, and it is a, a question that we have spend a lot of time uh, thinking and reflecting um, upon. I think that. In, in perpetuity, in perpetuity moving forward, this academic year will have an asterisk. And the asterisk will be this uh, student record or this set of uh, teaching and learning happen in the context of this enormous, enormous undertow that the pandemic uh, represents. We know, we know uh, the pandemic opened the curtain to, some, to, to things that many of us have devoted our lives to, to studying, to documenting, uh, and, to, uh, and to endeavoring to reverse. And that is the inequities in the opportunities to teach and to learn. This is what we're learning is extraordinarily worrisome. Uh, not only in the context of higher education, let me, uh, 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 remind, um, uh, remind us all, millions and millions of children the world over um, months ago were shut up of education uh, where the opportunity for remote learning simply doesn't exist. So 
I believe that this year, the year 2020, will remain with a parenthesis forever. We will have a moment before coronavirus, the new BC. There is a reality prior to the pandemic. There is a reality after the pandemic. So I believe it is our responsibility to fully register the complexity of the lives and the endeavors and the suffering of our communities in the context of the reality of today. I am a big believer, Shirley, that one of the best measures of human endeavors is the idea of how far have we traveled from where we come from? Distance travel. The stories of the travails, the stories of the hardships that are overcome are profound today. They're humbling and they remind us of our call to offer the opportunities to learn to all our students, to all our communities. So uh, we had a few questions about online learning, and um, you know, couple, I'm going to kind of uh, meld this, the questions together. <laughs> I think they're somewhat related. So, um, uh, so one question is about: Will online learning help reduce the cost of a four-year degree? Because maybe you don't need to be on campus anymore and, and be a boarder, uh, you know, pay room and board. Um, and also uh, related to that is, uh, you know, what is, is UMass Boston and other universities, are you doing anything to make online only education a delivery system that's equivalent to traditional hybrid systems? So um, there is enormous uh, experimentation, Shirley, there is enormous teaching and learning. Um, uh, today, uh, in in, uh, in what are what is the right um, formula? What is the right balance? First, paradoxically, the pandemic and the migration to remote imposed more, not less, costs to us. Meaning, again, on a dime, we had to move everything to remote. This required upgrading technologies. This required the, the, our, our endeavors to make sure that our staff, our, our faculty, and our students have the tools they need, the basic tools they need to be able to engage, to be able to continue uh, the, uh, their, uh, their progress. So in the short term, there were additional costs associated with uh, teaching and learning. As we get better, as the technologies get better, as we're able to offer a more diverse buffet of options for uh, teaching and learning, I believe that harvesting what we're learning should be put in the service of the following kind of basic algorithm. How do we offer? the best academic, scientific, scholarly, humanistic experience to our students in a way that uh, uh, will let them not leave college with these burdensome, burdensome student debts that are so um, undermining of the future of, uh, of our students moving forward. I believe that we are facing here a, the proverbial uh, chew and walk. We can do better online while we endeavor to reduce costs, which in the long term will give greater access to more diverse uh, communities where the excellence and the engagement can remain a constant. That's the challenge. I mean, is it clear post-pandemic that 
on remote only or online only learning, it'll be more acceptable or more, uh, you know, um, you know, considered uh, part of the mainstream and that more more kids would actually choose that type of education, especially if it's cheaper. I mean, is, is that what's kind of in the forecast for higher education? I think that um, uh, surely uh, if I was into predicting the future, I'd be in Vegas. I wouldn't be in Boston <laughs> Harbor. So that's, that's my point of departure. I do believe that we're gonna have a moment before the pandemic and a moment after the pandemic. I believe that we're learning and I believe that increasingly the buffet of options for our students, which are not just young people, we have the whole range of the life cycle in our student body, um, will have more opportunities. And I believe that online various uh, remote uh, various online initiatives will become part of the uh, menu of options. I think there are all kinds of claims to be made in, in favor of that. Once you achieve the excellence, uh, the, ethic, uh, the ethics, and the equity, um, do we need to have everyone in the, uh, in the T, in the buses? Do we need to have everybody driving? Uh, what are the environmental implications? Could we not have offer access to students in the, in the, uh, um, in the uh, comfort of their own uh, space uh, to take one class that they need to take? Why should they have to get into, the, uh, into public transportation or into a car, uh, drive to campus, uh, a drive back when the quality of a remote is getting better and better. So I would say two things are true. A, face-to-face -face teaching and learning will stay for us as long as we remain a species that is so social, a species where all learning is distributed, where all learning is part of a social process. It is also true that new technologies uh, remote, uh, online, will offer options where folk will be able to choose. There are all kinds of innovative options. Um, one model, for example, is students uh, can choose um, to join a class, bricks and mortar, or stay home. And the, the faculty will offer the course. Um, half the students will be remote, half the students will be uh, bricks and mortar. So they, there are enormous, that's called high flex, there are enormous um, possibilities in the context of so much loss and so much suffering. I think that we are continuing to innovate and we are continued, continuing to endeavor to understand what do our students need? Mm -hmm. What is working? Are they learning? Are they making the progress we expect them to make? These are the questions that we address on a regular basis, Shirley. So uh, we, we, we're still getting questions and I still have pre-submitted questions, but before we go back to those questions, I have a couple more questions for you. I want the audience to get to know you a little bit more. Um, you credit your success to the power of education, specifically the power of public education. Uh, you came here from Argentina, your parents put you on a plane uh, at the age of 17 with $50 in your pocket. Um, so tell us more about how you were able to achieve the American dream. Thank you, I pinch myself. Uh, you know, it was one of the Wright brothers who said, uh, you know, if you wanna be successful, um, you know, be, get to be born in Ohio and choose your parents. Well, you don't choose your parents and you don't really choose where you get to, to be born. But I did, um, I, 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 was, um, I was blessed. I came to this country, as you suggested, age 17, $50 in my pocket, and I landed in the state of California, the state that has the other great public uh, university system. And I was, uh, I went to work, I went to night school to learn English, I went to community college, and in community college, one of my mentors in community college, the world in academia is divided between mentors 
and tormentors. I learned very early on, Charlie, to stick with the mentors and avoid the tormentors when I was young. It's one of the first lessons. I, I like that. I, I, <laughs> that describes my life now, <laughs> not just school. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So um, I was, you know, my advisor took me to the uh, other great public research university, the University of California, Berkeley, and Berkeley changed my life. Berkeley opened enormous opportunities. I, I feel so enormously thankful to uh, the, 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 this is called the California Master Plan, meaning community college, the, the, the California State University College system, and the University of California system. And the, 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 pores, the ways in which the systems can align if uh, I was a very good student, so I was able to transfer from community college to the great University of California, Berkeley. And my life changed. I'm the product of that great public uh, research university. It, uh, today, the Nobel Prize in Physics was announced. One went to a Berkeley professor, one went to a UCLA professor, I, I would say. Um, and it is, it was, in a sense, the, um, the love, the rigor, the tough love also of my faculty, of my advisors at Cal, first as an undergraduate and then in, in, during my graduate school years, that formed my character, that formed me uh, as a scientist, as a social scientist, as a scholar, as a public intellectual, now as an administrator. I believe that the higher education system in our country has a tradition of being enormously open and welcome to immigrant and refugees the world over. You look at our great institutions of higher learning from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton to the new school, uh, which was called the University of Exile in New York, to the great uh, University of Massachusetts, to the University of California system, there is a constant here. We have opened our arms to immigrant and refugee students. I benefited enormously from that act of love, generosity, humanity. It is now my responsibility to give back. This is why when the opportunity came to become chancellor of the only public research university in our city of education, I jumped at it, no ambivalence. And after the pandemic hit, I never thought twice about not honoring my word to come and to do the best I can to make sure that the opportunities I benefited from remain for the next generation of young Marcelos or Marias that come to our country today. Now, Marcel, we talked about this uh, a little bit earlier uh, last week when we first met, and uh, I asked you if, if a 17-year-old Marcelo had arrived in the America of today, do you think you could have achieved the same amount of success? Sadly, 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 Shirley, uh, I have real concerns that the great promise, that the great promise of education as a vehicle for mobility is not working as well as it should and as well as it has in the past. Historically, historically, we came to our country with hopes, with dreams, with grit, with a work ethic, and with a fundamental optimism. The research on this is very clear. This is what, how, um, uh, what motivates immigrants to come to our country. The elevator in which we got in was going up. 
today the elevator is being is in maintenance. Hmm. We're trying to fix the elevator. And that's, I believe, the most significant endeavor in higher education in our country. So that all students, immigrant, non-immigrant, native, uh, all students have the opportunity to learn and to thrive. This is the fundamental uh, truth that has endured over the generations. We've had struggles, we've had inequalities, but the general arc of development, I'm quoting now from the, the great reverend, is towards a more moral, a more humane, a more just society. Speaking of elevators, <laughs> we have more questions to the audience and, and there's one along the lines of, of fixing the elevator or maintaining the elevator, making sure everyone goes up. So from where you sit, how do you think high schools and higher education can more effectively work together to, cre to increase access and persistence in our local two-year and four-year public, public institutions? Thank you. I've thought a great deal about this, Charlie, and thank you for uh, thank you for the question. I'm a big believer in um, uh, relevance, and I'm a big believer in the idea of developing meaningful, authentic partnerships so that we can work better uh, with our K-12 systems to ensure that we develop the pipelines that are needed for our university to maintain the vibrancy, the diversity, to maintain, to be true to its, its uh, um, uh, charter and its uh, raison d'etre, reason for being. I have the charter of the great University of Massachusetts, Boston here when it was first founded. We are the university of and for the city. We are here to serve and as inequalities continue to invade every domain of our economy and society, I know of no other instrument, the greatest achievement of the human neocortex is the idea of education, is the idea of literacy, is the idea of teaching and learning. I developed at the great University of California our, a, a university that has so much in common to the great University of Massachusetts system, a set of partnerships with our local schools, uh, which became my responsibility. I was the Dean of the uh, Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. We had a network of schools in the most underserved uh, communities in uh, that city, uh, serving our Latino uh, communities, serving our Asian uh, communities serving our African-American communities. And our endeavors rested on the idea that excellence and diversity put in the service of creating a pipeline so that we could get a, the, uh, as an outcome, cohorts of young people to have the opportunity and to be ready to thrive as they arrive at Columbia Point campus uh, here in Boston. So I'd like to see more partnerships with the Boston schools. Uh, I believe that um, we've learned an enormous um, uh, amount about community schools and their endeavors to uh, create really a K to college ecosystem so that every child wakes up in the morning thinking, I'm going to college. I'm going to succeed in college. Great, so beyond partnerships with BPS, are, are, are there other kinds of partnerships that you'd like to form in the community um, beyond uh, with, with, with schools? I don't know if there's industry or, or other partnerships that can be forged. Uh, very much so. Um, uh, I believe 
that uh, the pandemic, again, um, has revealed the wicked, wicked inequities when it comes to health, uh, healthcare, health, health uh, access. Uh, this is a domain <clears throat> where um, I believe we need to do more and we need to do better. 150 years ago, Charles Darwin told the world, educate, you know, in the notebooks that became the origins of, of the species, he has a marginal comment that he wrote, marginalia. He said, educate girls, educate girls, twice the impact, twice the impact. Today we know that education is the royal pathway to better health, to better, to, to wellness, to a fuller and a more vibrant, a more meaningful, a more purposeful life. The nexus between education and health is fundamental. Health and education are two very, very strong industries in uh, the city of Boston and in the Commonwealth. I want us to do more. If you think about health as a very complex ecosystem, part of it is industry, part of it is research, part of it is education. We need to be um, doing more capturing this link between health and education. We currently, I'm extraordinarily proud of the wonderful, wonderful work of our nurses, our health practitioners, our first responders at UMass Boston. We need to learn more and we need to develop um, more partnerships, more relevance to an industry that I believe will uh, be extremely significant to the future of our city and the future of our commonwealth. All right, we have eight minutes left, but actually you and I can only talk for about seven minutes or <laughs> six minutes. So I have two more questions for the audience, just to give you a sense of timing. You addressed this early on, but, but maybe I just wanna make sure that, um, that the audience feels that uh, the, uh, they got a, a satisfying answer, which is there were a bunch of questions about the affordability of college. So how do, how do we reconcile, uh, reconcile the high rising cost of public higher education and the student loan debt, debt that burdens graduates and so the next generation can live more financially balanced? How, how, do, you, how do you solve that imbalance? I think that we need to do better and we are looking at uh, every all of the all of the factors. How do we offer a buffet of options, some of which can reduce the costs of uh, progress uh, to to degree? How do we engineer new instruments, uh, certificates, other ways to give students more options so that um, they can be the architects of their own destiny? They can decide. They can make the judgments as to where to invest. I, I, uh, the cost of higher education is, uh, is real and our costs uh, continues to increase. Uh, what's missing here in the algorithm is that um, we need all public universities in our country need more investment, not less from our local governments, from uh, the states in which um, our universities are so central to the future of our cities and our states. The question is uh, who pays for what is um, undoubtedly uh, um, growing costs in providing a world-class education. I like to see our university get more and better supports from our state, 
I also understand that we need to diversify the portfolio. I also understand that uh, the foundations in our country need to step up. And I believe everybody's gotten the memo now. Inequality is the grave, grave threat to democracy in our country and beyond. Uh, the foundations need to do more. The philanthropic class needs to do more. Our own researchers, of course, they are moving mountains to get grants so that they can support their research, they can support their students, which in turn uh, it translates into better education and better outcomes for all our communities. So I am concerned. I believe that we need to develop more vehicles so that our students have the opportunities they need to reach their goals and their goals will be diverse and their goals will not be unilineal and we need to be mindful of this. So this is the last question from the audience before I hand back to Ian from UBS. Um, so this question, I know you said you don't like to predict the future. <laughs> you would be in Vegas, but we do have a question about the future. So, uh, so what will higher education look like in 10 years when my grandchildren will be college aged? <laughs> in terms of cost, what they'll be learning? The pandemic will be over. There will be extraordinary new fields of inquiry we will have uh, amazing advances in the worlds of teaching and learning, in the worlds of uh, the nexus between biology, engineering, and uh, the human and the human brain. We will uh, be, um, a, I hope, a more um, a, a more egalitarian society a more humane society, a society that values learning, that values the contribution that every single member of the Commonwealth has to make to our collective sense of purpose. I am an educator. You know, by definition, and the best definition of education, comes from a great Italian thinker, the great Loris Malaguzzi, the father of Reggio children, the best preschools in the world. Malaguzzi, looking at another time of enormous suffering and loss, famously said, education should be a nostalgia for the future, not a nostalgia for the past, because the past is full of all kinds of problems and nostalgia for the future. And that means where we're going to meet your grandson, where we're going to engage her, where she will flourish in the context of so much that is yet unknown, so much that remains to be discovered, so much good that our collective purpose can deliver for the good of us all for the Commonwealth. Great. Thank you, Marcel. Thank you, Chancellor. Um, thank you for your time today. I'm gonna hand it back to Ian uh, McNeil. Shirley, thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Marcelo and Shirley, for these really insightful discussion you guys were, were hosting here. Um, we, we can't stress enough how important it is to provide access to higher education and ensure that our students are set up for success. Marcelo, the future you painted, uh, your comments on your students' physical and emotional health, as well as the comments on you know, younger students' remote learning this year and with an asterisk. Uh, resonated so well for me and I hope for the audience. Um, the recent unpredictability of the market has made saving for college more important than ever. And with the help of our trusted advisors at UBS, we encourage you to speak with them to gain insights into college planning. Those costs are real, Marcel. Uh, thank you again for the time this afternoon discussing the future of public higher education as it becomes reshaped by the pandemic. 
and challenged to lead the way on social justice. Our next program's focus uh, is on the need for and the push for more women of color and leadership roles across the spectrum of business, political, and civic realms. The discussion will feature Beth Chandler, President and CEO of YW Boston, Juanya Matias, uh, political and uh, politician and attorney for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and Linda Dorsenia Foray, former Massachusetts State Senator. Uh, we will be webcasting on Monday, October 26th at noon, and we're very much looking forward to seeing you there. Thank you, Shirley. Thank you, Marcelo. Have a great day. Thank you.